Hello, welcome to the Charity Impact Podcast, where we aim to help you increase your charity's income and impact by sharing the experience and expertise of our guests. I'm Alex Blake, your podcast host, and I'm joined today by two guests from the Smallwood Trust, their Chief Exec Paul Carberry and Trustee Ambreen Shah. Um, we're going to be discussing the transformational change process they've been through at this grant-making trust and what some of the key developments have been. So welcome to the podcast, Ambreen. Paul, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Good afternoon. So we're going to talk about the transformation, but do you uh, do you want to just give us a little bit of a brief introduction to the Smallwood Trust? Uh, what, why is it? What do you do? Sure. So the trust has been going for 136 years now, and our mission is to enable women um, to be financially resilient. And how we've really gone about that is um, helping women out of poverty. That's our history. And we continue to do that through a variety of programs. But over the years, um, we've changed quite a lot um, how we go about our grant making. So we achieve our mission through mainly through our grant making, but also increasingly we're looking at providing more sort of wraparound support for the organisations and the individuals that um, we support. And we've got some live discussions at the moment about how we more actively share the learning that we're getting from our various programmes. So as a grant maker, we fund across all different areas. So we make grants to frontline service delivery organisations um, we provide funding that goes direct to individuals, so more type of hardship funds. Um, we provide grants to policy organisations who are trying to influence. Um, obviously, we'll maybe come on to this in more detail, but we also have quite a significant investment in place-based initiatives at the moment where we've identified a number of places in England at the moment where we're putting quite a lot of money and we're sort of working out what the longer term change might be there, but working more directly with the local communities and local women in those areas. Okay, yeah, that'd be interesting to come on to. So we're going to talk a bit about the sort of change process that you guys have been through. So what was the sort of emphasis for that beginning? What was the situation at the Trust there when you decided to to make those changes? The, the trigger for it really was um, probably initially about six or seven years ago, um, when um, the trustees at the time instigated some governance changes um, so we could extend our board. And at the time, a, a long time serving member of staff had retired. And up until that point, we were only making grants to individuals. And we'd been doing it, doing that for about the last 50, 60, 70 years or so. And so small grants of around a thousand pounds, fifteen hundred pounds a year to help individuals with their immediate needs, whether that might be paying for, you know, groceries, electricity bill, um, general sort of living cost to um, if women were in poverty. But the process was very bureaucratic and quite cumbersome. And the board at the time decided that they wanted to um, look into other ways of helping women out of poverty. And that's where the mission was created, enabling women to be financially resilient. And really, that's that those were the first steps. And then there's been a lot of steps since then. And it's, you know, it's only looking back that you can then, you can almost plot out the path that we took. But it was a very iterative process. And one positive step led to another, which lead, led us to where we are today. But the initial steps were, New trustees with different perspectives and skills and experience were brought on to the board. So one of those was Ambreen a couple of years later. I was appointed as the trust's first chief executive. So we didn't have a chief executive before. We had paid staff, but not a chief executive. Um, we did some technical governance changes to our constitution and, and things like that. And then we began to experiment really um with providing funds to organizations who are service delivery organizations who are supporting women that met our mission as well as continuing to provide um grants to individuals and that was really the starting point and then we kind of went into a cycle where we evaluated those initial grants to organizations um they were all you know doing really good work and we could see there was a 
sometimes a deeper impact with providing that type of funding. And then we decided to increase that. Then we developed a strategic plan around that. And in later years, we've started talking more about shifting power, the sort of targeting of our funds as well, and being more intentional about identifying the inequalities that happen and providing funds to target those as well, all within our mission of enabling women to be financially resilient. So that took us in quite a lot of different areas. But we also, over that time, have changed our recruitment processes. So we've increased our staff, brought new skills into the staff team as well as, um, you know, the board as well. And so what what sort of time period are we talking about, Paul, from the sort of start of that process to through trying those different things out and where we are now? So that is about six and a half years, I would say. Okay. And so, but it's felt like we've been really busy with that change all of the time. And I think one reflection that I would have as a chief executive, and I think, you know, we talk about this in terms of the longer term change we want to have with our impact outcomes through our funding that, you know, we might need to wait five or 10 years. But it, the same applies to us, really. It's taken six to seven years to make all those changes in a sort of measured and managed way and learning ourselves as we go along to get where we are today. Um, and so, the, so, the, so the same changes have applied to us as an organisation, you know, that we're trying to support through our grant funding as well, I would say. That's my perspective. I mean, Ambreen, who came in, you know, just after we started all the changes, might have, well, obviously will have her own perspective of how things have happened as well. Yeah, I mean, I came in two years ago. I was just looking up how long it's been. It's been about two years. So I guess Smallwood was already on this journey. And I came in as a result of being on that journey. But for me, an observation is that as an organisation, it hasn't waited for something to be perfect. <laughs> and I think Paul used the word, exper- you know, we've experimented. And I think things have worked in parallel. So actually recognizing that money wasn't going to certain groups and has historically not gone to certain groups, something was done about that. The intention was there to change it. And actually through the grant programs that were being developed, that intention made a huge difference. I remember having a conversation with Paul and saying, what's helped us shift actual money going to marginalized communities in the way that we haven't done in the past? And he said, intention. It was That was the intention. That was what we wanted to do. And therefore, it's happened. And so we haven't waited for the perfect policy, the perfect vision statement to be produced before action is taken. Action has been taken. That's changed the culture. And things have evolved. And so things are working in parallel. And I think that's been quite insightful as, as I've observed some of the changings of, as a, from a trustee perspective. Yeah, it's really interesting. So I think in, in the grant making sector, particularly often you see as a decision to change and then it's like the everything shuts down so it's kind of like right, we're not making grants or you know we're not open to anything anymore we're going to do this really in-depth review and then we're going to come out with like the perfect strategy and then we'll launch all these new grant programs and things and then all of those charities that might have been wanting to apply or have been relying for their funding and kind of sitting there waiting um for what seems like a long time sometimes so i think i think it's it's really good to see that sort of practical approach to trying things out and, you know, keeping things moving while you're, as you're learning and iterating. I think one of the things that's helped with that as well, sorry, Ari, um, is um, the individuals involved in Smallwood, it, it's, we've all been on the same page right from the start. And so the, the initial process was led by the board and then we recruited myself, you know, then we recruited additional people in the executive team. Everyone's always been on the same page. You know, like in any organization, there's always different tactics or different ways of doing things. But in terms of the overall direction, we've all been on the same page right from the start, and that's really helped. And then there's been some, what I would say, acceleration points. Yes, yeah, so certainly when Ambreen and another trustee joined at the same time, that created a bit of acceleration in some of our thinking as well, certainly in terms of shifting power within our grant making and so on and being more equitable. Etc. And so there's kind of been, a, I don't know, quite a lot of symbiotic relationships that have, that have happened, you know. Um, so, I mean, I guess part of that is intentional because we've, we've been quite open. So, you, you know, in terms of our work, but I don't think that, is, that to me is a major factor, though, is that the executive 
and the board have always been on the same page and the board have been in the lead in terms of making all the changes and we've sort of gone away and um, helped implement that. And what, what's been the sort of structure for that? So has there been, was there kind of a, a strategy produced that had maybe like four pillars and then within that you kind of try different things out and experiment or was it kind of less formally structured than that? Or was it more of a case of here's a whole bunch of things we'd like to try out and kind of taken it from there? No, so, so we did in the in about a year, so I joined in about 2017, so in about midway through 2018, the board approved a formal five-year strategic plan, but it was quite broad. Um, you know, looking back on it now, it, you know, it was also you know, relatively basic, but it, it did give us the flexibility, I think, to then try all things out and then you know find out what was working in terms of our grant funding and how we wanted to distribute the funds and we were both the board and the executive were open to being influenced as well by other ports other organizations so i guess to a certain degree we were a bit like a magpie as well in terms of looking at other ideas you know and trying to adapt them for our purposes but we did have a strategic plan that centered around really we still wanted to honor the foundational principles of Edith Smallwood, who was the trust founder 136 years ago, which was very much about alleviating poverty and providing that immediate support to relieve, um, you know, needs that are happening right at this moment. Excuse me. So it's still about 50% of Smallwood's funding goes towards that. And the, the major change in terms of strategic priorities was we wanted to think about how we might create longer term change so women in the future wouldn't also be dragged into poverty because of circumstances and that's the the side of our work that's had the most development i would say and it's got the most potential even you know moving forward and we've done additional initiatives in relation to that but we did have that strategy and now it was about a year ago we then refreshed that strategy. So as Amber was saying, we're a bit more intentional about what we want to do for the next three years. Though, though I think we're already talking, aren't we, Amber, about having a 10-year strategy at some point. So, yeah. um, so there was, we did have those mechanisms. The other thing I would say on reflection that's really helped is that we've had quite a small board. So there's six, we've got six board members. And I think that's really helped with us all developing our learning and understanding together, even though there's lots of different viewpoints, you know, on the board. And I think the chemistry of that has really helped in terms of when you're going through quite a lot of major change, which we've done as an organisation, um, that kind of helps that we kind of had that. Um, you know, those relationships were really well, were managed to be really well established. I do have to say that as a, we are privileged as an organisation, though, in that we had we do have about a thirty million pound permanent and expendable endowment. So, unlike a lot of the organisations we support, who are, you know, almost in crisis mode because of the scarcity of funding in the women's sector, we did have that privilege of having that endowment funding that also enabled us to make this change without a lot of stuff being at risk. So it's quite a, quite a privileged position to be in, I think, because we weren't worried about finances. Oh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that if the kind of organisations delivering the work, if they did have a sort of endowment mm-hmm. that they were sitting on, even if it wasn't a £30 million one, if it was something like, you know, a year or two's worth of running costs, then most grant makers won't support them. Yes, that's true, yeah. Ironically, even though, you, you know, like you, you kind of want them to be sustainable yeah. organisations and so on, but but then having the money already in place, then... They kind of don't need the grant funding in, in, in those immediate terms. So it's always difficult to kind of get past a certain point of building up reserves, isn't it? Once you go yeah. past maybe kind of nine months or so running costs, then you start to it starts to inhibit your ability to fundraise in, in the grant making space anyway. Yeah, I mean we I mean that's a really interesting point. So I think that does connect to redistribution of power and assets, doesn't it? Because we tended not to take a hard line approach on things like reserves we obviously look at it as part of our assessment criteria but it's taken as a whole of what the proposal is in front of us we wouldn't necessarily not fund an organization because they were deemed to have high levels of reserves for example you know there are lots of 
context and nuances with all of these situations, especially at the moment in the position that a lot of frontline organizations find themselves in. Um, one of the things that we did was that we devolved, it's about just under a million pounds of our funding to local community women's organizations, and they distribute these grants to individuals on our behalf. And they have total autonomy to do that how they want. I mean, there's a we do have a framework that they kind of work to, but they make the decisions locally on those individual grants. And I think there's something in that that needs that we could explore further in our sort of next strategic phase. Um, part of that we we used to have, for example, that those organisations we would pay for twenty percent of their of overheads on on top of the grants that we gave them to redistribute for us. We would just move to a different model where we're just saying you just tell us what you need. So, which was a, real, a bit of a conscious effort to help those organisations not only cover all of their costs that they do have, but if some of those overhead costs go to building up their reserves, that's a really good thing, isn't it? I think ultimately, I mean, they can't always <laughs> afford to do that, but that that was you know partly what the thinking was behind that was not to is to move away from talking about 20% or 30%, let them just tell us and we should encourage them about what they need in terms of covering their costs. Yeah. And I think as a board, we have, we, I've, I'd say we are working to that sort of relationship model uh, in terms of thinking about building relationship with those community grant partners and also thinking about how we support them in the longer term. So there is a, a, a trust-based approach. So I think what that has enabled is that as a board, we're comfortable to say, well, we funded them for three years. We're going to continue to that relationship for another three because actually they're doing a great job. Um, and and I guess we will have to think about what how we continue that and how we build on those relationships without thinking about that sustainability model as well. So those are questions that we've got in our mind. But certainly having a longer-term relationship um, with organisations because they are they are our part genuinely our partners because without them we're not going to make the difference to the to the to the women that we're seeking to benefit in the in the local areas because they know those women best they can they can not only provide the money to get women over that crisis point but they can also provide sort of wraparound support because the money is often just the tip of the iceberg which we couldn't do centrally so I think that model and having the as a, as a board having the commitment to a model that that thinks about long-term sustainability of a, a sector that really struggles to secure long-term funding is something that is quite central to the way we think about what we do. Yeah, and I think it's really helpful having those sort of closer relationships for the charities involved as well. And aside from anything, just from the financial perspective, there's an understanding of there being a partnership there rather than it being kind of quite a um, limited dialogue and it's more a case of like we have to report back and then reapply again and maybe we'll get it and maybe we won't kind of thing and not having much engagement how how have you guys grappled with the sort of question around if you develop those kind of closer relationships with a, a group of organizations then i suppose there are only so many that you can do that with uh, and if you continue to support the same organizations which of course if they're doing a great job then why would you not you know, you can only support so many in that way. So then, of course, you're going to be excluding others. And, you know, then you, uh, yeah, whether you kind of miss opportunities to support other organisations you might want to, How what what's your sort of thinking been around that? Have you um, looked at that? It is on the agenda, actually, for one of our future subcommittee meetings. So, but we the board have discussed that, you know, at various points. And there isn't a you know, a silver bullet, I don't think, to that conundrum. We've tried to take a balanced approach where possible, where, you know, most of the partners that Ambreen highlighted there, we, they're in the fourth year of six-year funding, um, most of them are. But we have brought on new partners as well where additional funding has allowed. And so it's an ongoing sort of delicate Balance. So, I guess on a practical basis, in terms of our grants, grants budgets, we there is we always like to have an element of flexibility in there. So, if there are new organisations or other programmes we want to look at, we there is some funding for that. So, not all of our money is totally tied up 
into the future, but there will be, I guess, moving forward, there will be more decisions on which organisations to fund that we'll have to come to. So the conversation that the board will be continuing to have will be around what legacy do we want to leave? What is the sustainability of these organisations? But it's a very difficult one because the majority of the organisations that we fund are really struggling financially in terms of you know their other income streams and um, burnout of staff as well you know so there's um staff that are leaving the sector as well because of the the challenging nature of the work that's involved and and so on and so there are quite a lot of deep challenges as well um so i guess it's just a question of keep keeping that as a live discussion and um, our resources are finite, obviously. But one thing that we have managed to do is, um, well, there's two things really, um, but the conundrum is still there in terms of whether you keep funding existing or bring in new partners as well, is because of our journey, we've been quite open about our journey with our peers and, and so on. It has We have um, then been in partnership with other funders as well. So that's helped increase the amount of funding that Smallwood has been able to deliver because we've been working in partnership with other grant funders as well. And so for the next two or three years, about 50% of our grants budget is in partnership with other funders. Obviously, that, that also is a sustainability question for us about how long you know that, that funding might um, be available. But that's definitely been a key part of our approach. And also part of our investments, there is an expendable endowment as part of that as well. And the board, have well, they agreed first about three or four years ago to start drawing down additional capital from that. So from Smallwoods, so Smallwoods funds could increase. And at a recent meeting, um, the board have decided to continue drawing down about an extra million pounds or so to add to the income that we might get from those investments. But that, again, is a delicate sort of balancing act, especially when the investment markets are in as well. But yeah, the, the, all that legacy sustainability is a live question. I think and it's Ambry who's been raising that, I think. Oh, Ambry. Yeah, and I guess as a, as a board member, it's it's to, it, for, for me, it's to ask the question, isn't it? So on the one hand, absolutely, we want to build trusting relationships and see the benefit of that. But on the other hand, I don't want to be a, a funder with closed doors to, to new applicants, recognising there are groups that are forming for all sorts of different reasons, new needs, different different client groups, um, and that we need to be open. So I guess, and that's what keeps the conversation live. So there's no... As, Paula said no magic bullet, but it is recognising that we want to be able to do both. Um, and how can we balance the portfolio so we're able to do both? Talks about the um, sort of longer term change that you're looking for. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about some of the sort of tactics there? So is it, uh, I'm just going to restart that question. So I've just got a little bit of echoey stuff going on there. So uh, you spoke before about wanting to achieve more long term change. Just wondered what sort of tactics there were around that. Is that around some of the funding of sort of policy work, or is it more uh, some of those sort of close post initiatives? What are what are the sorts of things that you see being the ways that you can achieve that longer term change? So we've we're doing both, uh, but we're we're putting more money into the place based initiatives, but then trying to link the policy organisations we fund with the organizations that are on the ground which sounds kind of quite an obvious thing to do but you know that's what we're trying to do that with our with funding and so that was born really again the, the board you know that that was the board who kind of were in the lead on in terms of us thinking about longer term change and so um you know and we were also you know inspired by other funders who were on the kind of same journey as ourselves and so we and we'd had the experience of supporting quite a lot of these local partners as well. So we've selected a number of areas and we've put quite significant funding in there. With the, the aim is to reduce gendered poverty. Um, we're working very closely with our partners um, for them to come up with the ideas and processes and things that need to happen locally. So they, there are some 
ideas around that already that local partners have articulated to us. But we've, and those programs have been going for 12 to 18 months now, we've been funding them. But we've spent this first year or so cementing the part. They're all partnerships of about seven or eight organizations. So making those partnerships stronger and cementing them, providing them with unrestricted funding so that can happen and helping them think through what are the changes that they want to see locally. So when we had the proposals in, they weren't, you know, fully formed proposals in the, in the normal sense of things but they we thought these partnerships had potential to look at the root causes of gendered poverty in their local areas and some of that is about changing the processes or um that happen locally you know some groups are excluded from certain discussions at statutory levels and so on you know that we've had lots of feedback where Communities are not invited to consultations and don't feel part of, you know, what's the decisions that have been made locally. And so as part of all of that work, we've been co-designing grants programs with local communities. And even though that might look quite traditional on the face of it, the aspect that is new for Smallwood anyway is, you know, the, the individual members of those communities who are helping us design those programs you know, they, they do have equal, um, it is an equal partnership in terms of them coming up with ideas and us supporting them to do that. That has been quite transformational, I think, for for us as an organisation, but also, you know, for some of those individuals that have been working with us in the local community, because there was quite a lot of mistrust, quite rightly, I think, of institutions coming into areas and saying, you know, we've got a pot of money and this is what we want to do. Um so a lot of the first year has also been about building trust with the local organisations and communities that we're working with before we even begin to look at bigger picture uh, initiatives, even though that is the end goal. So that's why, you know, the board have been talking about we really need to be looking at five, ten years, you know, even beyond that, I guess, in reality. So they're the kind of – so we've put about – overall, I think we've maybe – awarded about three, three and a half million in our place-based initiatives in terms of multi-year funding. But already we kind of know that we've got to be funding them on into the future as well. Um, and we did do a, we did do a pilot programme with the place base. So about five years ago, we started funding a partnership called the Coventry Women's Partnership. But at the time, we wouldn't have called it a place-based. I was reflecting on this the other day. At the time, we wouldn't have called it a place-based initiative. It was just an, an initiative to bring five or six organisations together in Coventry. And the purpose of that was to help strengthen their referral networks because there was a, a women's refuge and employability project, a women's aid organisation, um, and a couple of other organisations within that partnership. And they all knew each other. But uh, one of the drivers was to when um, women came to use their services, they were often having to tell their story five or six different times, which is re-traumatizing. So they wanted to build a stronger referral network. So that's how we thought of that. And then we kind of thought, oh, that, that is like a, quite a good example of a place-based initiative. So then there was an economic evaluation done of that particular partnership as well after the first three years, and that again gave us the impetus to try and learn from that and then see if we could develop that approach in other areas as well. Yeah, I was going to ask if that's the sort of intention with the place-based projects is that you learn and hopefully identify a model that works. You see that it has an impact and it can then be shared so that it can be replicated in in other areas and potentially at sort of national level of policy as well where it's relevant. I think that would be the ultimate ambition. What's Interesting, isn't it, Ambreen? I think is that all of the places are so different. Obviously, the places themselves are different, and the programs we're funding are very different. So, I guess, and we're working with an external learning part, partner on one of those programs, which has been really helpful. So, we don't know yet what those replicable bits will be, but that will be something that we'll want to find out because it might not be. You know, it's never as simple as it is taking a model in one area and, and trying to do it in another place. So, you know, but we're hopefully with our learning partner, we'll be able to identify some of those things that can be transferred or adapted elsewhere. 
I guess the key thing is to think about the ingredients that it takes to create. And Paul's done very well in in avoiding the jargon, but what we're essentially trying to do is systems change. So look at the local systems that prevent women from doing, you know, from or ending up in poverty and how, how can they change and what needs to change, but doing that in a way that really centers that lived experience and gives those women who experience uh, are at the sort of uh, receiving end of the issues that they're facing, giving them the power to really support and to enable them to take a lead, I guess. So, it, but as Paula said, they're in such different places and some are really, you know, some are thinking about systems change now and others are a million way, miles away from systems change. That It's about building trust. And for me, really, it's it's supporting the learning partner to think about what are the ingredients that need to be in place in order to build trust, to centre those voices, to uh, have the relationships with those decision makers in local areas to really think about the systems that might need to change. And again, as a board, I think even when we started on this process and then COVID hit, we knew that the organisations leading this work, their capacity was going to be limited, that we as a board need to be really patient and we need to recognise that we've done this. And although the initial agreement was for three years this is not a three-year program it won't be a three-year program if you really want to make a difference and so we have taken it that we're going on a journey with them and the conversations that we have at board level is constantly checking in to say well do we need to adjust do we need to be flexible do we need to, is more needed here uh, in order to make that difference so I guess um, it wouldn't it wouldn't have been able to do it if we decided it was a three-year program system change and we're going to have this pathway That's not what this programme is about. And I I think that patience is probably needed uh, and to go on the journey with the organisations that are leading. Right. So I think, I mean, that example of the place-based initiatives probably picks up on a whole load of the kind of key strands from that that strategy in terms of um, shifting power and more kind of trust-based funding and so on, uh, working in partnership. What What are some of the other things that you might want to pick out? Are there some some more sort of internal changes that have enabled small trust to then be able to work in that way. Uh, something can maybe around sort of recruitment. Uh, I know you've done the sort of board shadowing and things like that, some of those types of initiatives. Yeah, I think the board shadowing has been really important. And we're in the second, uh, Ambreen, it's Ambreen's idea, so I'll let Ambreen, Ambreen should really talk to this um, but it has, and I've just noticed, Ambreen, like recently that we're still getting quite a lot of inquiries from other organisations about how we do it. And so um, that's been really good, obviously, but it's been, it shows that there are lots of other trusts and foundations anyway that are thinking about, about it. Um, and it has made a huge difference, I think, in small work, but Ambreen should talk to that. So that was her initiative. Yeah, I guess two years ago when I joined Smallwood, one of the things that I was very conscious of is that I guess I was thinking about how can that lived experience voice be more central uh, to the organisation. And sometimes these things take a lot of time. So it was like, what what quick, easy steps can we take to just move in the right direction? And so the idea was born about could somebody shadow me? This was my first trustee role to sort of just to follow, I guess, what it what it means to be a board member, to open up that space. And this was also in the context of recognising that governance within the charitable sector isn't isn't diverse yet. Uh, It's still predominantly male, predominantly older age groups, highly educated, um, and therefore, and, 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 not working class you know so you know so there there is a certain demographic that's that sort of leads governance and so putting all of these things together it was like well could we open up that space could we do it in a way that um centers that lived experience voice a bit more but also then just takes away the myth that sits around who sits around boards the good and the great and who you know what type of person can do it and could it be someone like me uh, when you normally probably rule yourself out so that was the original in- Tension. So we went out and recruited what we described as we wanted people, women with lived experience of poverty. That's the way it was described. And a number of women came forward and we took a, a sort of a cohort approach and took forward like three in the first cohort and four in the second. And the scheme, I think, has grown over time. And in my mind, there are 
sort of loads of different benefits. Our intention was never to get people to shadow me with the intention that they would become future board members of Smallwoods. That wasn't the intention. It was really to open up that opportunity in a way that recognised that in this case, women often are juggling a range of things and the headspace to think about boards and board papers perhaps isn't always there. So to create sort of quite a light touch approach whereby the minimum requirement, as it were, was that you turn up to a board meeting and observe, observe what's going on um, and just to see how that works for you. But that, as I said, has grown into a programme which, if you spoke to the women in this cohort, would go, it's been beyond what they thought it would would do for them in the sense, yes, as a minimum, people are going to board meetings. They're now participating in board meetings. And I think we made a conscious decision that in the third cohort, the offer will be to partake, to participate, not just to observe, and the value that we get out of that as a board as well but you know it's it's uh there are there are a number of things that that have happened so Paul has implemented a sort of bursary so that those women can have a, their development needs met and again it's not development needs in relationship to uh, some predefined notion of what we think they might need so you know do you need some support about learning more about governance because uh, this is actually it's what they need <laughs> so someone has spent some of that money on a course that they've been doing and, and to support that somebody else has been uh, this cohort has been created uh, doing a creative film again it's sort of focusing on women's issues so we supported a bit of funding for that because that's what she wanted there's been some coaching offered so women have had the opportunity to have three sessions of coaching which i know they found invaluable and that time to reflect on what they're doing and where they want to be and what they might need to do to get there i think has been something that they wouldn't have had a chance to to have that sort of opportunity there's a lived experience fee now being paid, so their time is being being valued uh, to turn up to meetings, to have, uh, you know, to to engage in the process. And then Paul and I have pre-board meetings with them so that they know what to expect at the board meeting to be able to ask questions. And we have built relationships. So there's a WhatsApp group that that, that I, you know, that, that we connect with one another. We ask how each other, we check in with one another. And so it's become, you know, they've become part of the Smallwood family. So they know other staff members, they know Paul, they know the other board members. And when we, when Paul again sends out papers, it's really normal to send it out to the all the group, including the shadowies. And for me, the most important thing, which is why I think when we first started having this conversation, it was like, oh, there's this shadowing scheme. And I was keen that Paul be brought into the conversation because what's happened is that it hasn't been this thing that sits outside of the organisation. The reason I think it's been so successful to date is because it's part of the mission of what Smallwood is doing. And it's just another route to all the ones that Paul's already talked about of enabling and empowering women uh, to be in control, as it were. And so it, it, it aligns to the mission and therefore now thinking about how we might grow it, how we might support others to think about the value of bringing people in and centering those lived experience voices into that board meeting have become really um, core cool to, to thinking about how we take it forward as well. So yeah, for me, it was it hasn't been this tick box. Hey, we've done this, aren't we great? It has been how we've sort of really embedded it within the organisation. You can tell in terms of their experiences and how full they've been that uh, that's been the case. And that's what's really, I think, made a real big difference in my mind of why this is working so well. I don't know, Paul, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with all of that. And one of the new things we did this year as well, because we had some external funding from the National Lottery Community Fund as part of the decision making process for that. Um, 50% of the panel members were our board shadowies. So, um, with equal decision making power on that panel. So they got the opportunity to not only to actually be decision makers in a process that signed off about 1.7 million pounds worth of grants. Um, so they were active, you know, participants in, in that as well. And so, that's something we will definitely be doing sort of moving forward as well. Yeah. And I think, and I've, I've been in, I've been a grant maker for many years in different guises and I have had processes where we've had grant making decision panels where we have wanted that lived experience in the room. So you've gone out and recruited someone to sit on that panel. But what happens in that scenario is that there isn't a relationship. That person 
has never done this before, it can be really quite intimidating. There's language that you don't understand. As as much as you try to in- integrate or to make it comfortable to be a full participant, there's always power dynamics at play. And the difference has been because we've had this program, these women are known to us, we're known to them. There is the confidence to be in the room and to have your voice heard, but to also speak. And so it was a real natural progression and quite easy to go, well, we're going to have a panel where half the panel has got lived, are bringing lived experience expertise into the room, as well as that, you know, they are whole people. <laughs> they bring all sorts of other experience into the room too. But to have that as well, along with the trustees, and it felt like a much more comfortable process for everyone involved, where actually those power dynamics were minimised and voices were treated equitably in the room because there is a prior relationship. They haven't just been brought in for one thing. So, and I'm sure things like that will, there will be other things that will evolve and other opportunities. Uh, yeah, I got a little bit of echo just on the very last bit there. Uh, I was just wondering whether you've thought about the sort of pros and cons of sort of shadowing program versus doing you know having people join the board fully or whether it's kind of you know not necessarily an either or and you can do both like I don't know if you've kind of thought about that because I suppose it sounds like on the one hand you might think oh well surely it's better to have like full board members with lived experience Uh, but there seems to be something there around the sort of slightly more dynamic nature of like having different cohorts of people coming through and kind of bring in, you know, different sets of experience and so on. So I don't know if that's something that you've kind of discussed or if you do have both already, so it's not a kind of either or question. I think that while that was never the aim, the reality is saying the first cohort, two of the um, cohorts went on to become trustees of other organisations. They gained enough confidence to be able to see themselves in that kind of role and when approached or when an opportunity came they had the confidence to apply (laughs) which I think they wouldn't have done otherwise and then I guess with Smallwood in particular I guess there is a as with any board there is a cycle of people coming on and off depending on the terms they've served and again we have made the decision that next time there is a vacancy those who are uh, part of the shadowing cohorts past and future uh, past past and present um will be guaranteed an interview should they want to apply for it um and therefore hopefully and then again it's more of a genuine they know us we know them they will be supported through the interview process yeah there'll be things that they'll have to meet um and it'll be an open recruitment because i do believe that we need to be openly recruiting trustee roles um in order to attract the widest range of people um but so hopefully that will happen <laughs> But like with many of things that I think Smallwood has done, it's not rushing into something. So it's done in a thoughtful and meaningful way. So it it feels right for the people who are then coming in. And that sometimes slow is better than just getting people in. And and then then, we know there's an issue of retention as well. You you join a board and then people leave because it just doesn't fit. And hopefully we won't have that problem because of the way it's been done. Yeah, so I I think the evolution of it has been really important. and And because of the... I guess the type of organisation we or are developing into that the idea for it happened very quickly, didn't Ambry? And Ambry emailed me and said, "Should we set up a board shadowing program?" I said, "Oh, that's a good idea. Let's ask the board." And the meeting was like two weeks later, and they said yes. And so that's kind of how it happened. It wasn't like a massive process of writing papers and all that kind of stuff. Because when you say it, it's immediately a really good idea and, and really hits our mission, as Ambry said. But then. It evolving every year since has felt really natural and the right thing for small within our own internal culture as well, rather than again coming up with a too much of a predefined idea about how, how that's going to happen. And it's enabled, I guess, the, the, our board and our staff as well to, you know, to find out more and be involved in the program over that period of time as well and get more comfortable with it so it kind of works both ways like that i think as well yeah and is it something that you'd recommend for lots of different types of charities then do you think it's quite a kind of replicable thing that could work in different contexts definitely the principles of it no. definitely i mean both ambreen and i have spoken to a num- number of other funders haven't we mainly but and other organizations as well and they all have their slightly different ways of doing things, don't they? But the principles behind it, I think, um, you know, from what we've seen anyway, you know, we've probably spoken to maybe 
I don't know, eight or ten other funders, have we, over the last year or so, who've been, who are doing or considering doing something similar themselves and we're just, you know, checking in with us to see, you know, about some of the practicalities and, you know, and, and how we went about it. There are other schemes. People call it different things. You could have a board apprentice. You can have trainee trustees. So there are other other models, um, all sort of with a similar aim in mind. Um, and I guess for me, the key thing is that um, it's just recognising the value. So if you've got a board that's quite closed or a bit reluctant to bring in new people, it's a really safe way to do that because you're almost mentoring. If you want to get more young people, if you want to get different perspectives, uh, more working class, you know, all the other people that aren't represented on those governance boards, if you want to bring them in in a safe way, it feels that this is a this is a good way to do it. There are schemes that are more structured. So ours is getting a little bit more. There's more bells and whistles attached, more opportunities um, as it develops. But it can be in its simplest form, it can be just observing a board meeting because that in itself is incredibly powerful because these are spaces that ordinarily are not open to people and people have preconceived ideas of what they're like and who they're for. So even just doing that can have a massive impact on both sides of the person who's doing it. So I think it is a very replicable model. How you do it for your organisation needs to be relevant for your organisation and where it's at. And it also needs to be relevant to the individuals that end up on that journey with you because they will be in different places as well and they will have different ambitions. So I'd say don't be fixed about what it should be and shouldn't be. It's about the the, the organisation and where it's at and the individuals and what they want out of it as well that shapes it to some degree. And we found that with the two different cohorts and how it's developed has been shaped by them as much as it is by us at some level. Okay. Um, uh, what was my next question? Um, so for for people wanting to learn more about some of the topics we've discussed are there any particular resources that you would recommend for people whether they're things that small would have produced or whether they're things that maybe you've accessed that you found helpful uh anything in in relation to say shifting power or trust-based funding place-based funding whatever it might be i mean we've definitely learned a lot from others so so in terms of like gendered poverty and its causes and consequences and so on. The, we fund an organisation called the Women's Budget Group and they take a, an economic analysis of all of those issues. So they've produced quite a lot of reports and continue to do so um, on gendered poverty and we've you know found that very helpful in terms of influencing our own strategy. We've spoken to a whole range of other funders with you know that are also supporting um, women, even if it's not, you know, as specifically as us. And we've learned, I've certainly learned a lot from working in partnership with other organisations. So the Middlesbrough programme that I mentioned earlier, we're doing that in partnership with two other grants to individuals funders turned to us on Buttle UK. And we've learned a lot in terms of the executive teams working with each other and the processes. Um, that's been really, really Good. One report that um, really sort of helped me with my thinking was um, Julia Unwin's report in, on on civil society and power. And I, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but that came out about what three or four years ago. And that really, even I was kind of like thinking about the how devolving power to our community grant partnerships, but the way that that report was laid out really influenced my own thinking. Um, and since then, there's um, people in the sector, aren't they, that are, I, I feel are quite inspirational and, and influential. So we've tended to take our resources a whole load of places. You know, I really like, like what Derek Bardemel has to say about race, for example, you know. And um, so there's lots of resources there. He's written a couple of books in, in connected with that. Um, we're influenced a lot by obviously the organisations we support in terms of, you know, what their thinking is and, you know, the resources that that they produce. Um, there was, I'm just trying, I mean, there's so many things, isn't there, Umbreen, that, um, that you kind of like, you kind of infuse, don't you, from, um, from else. I mean, I think, you know, it, campaigns like Black Lives Matter, for example, had a big impact. And 
other sort of sector initiatives like the Funders for Race Equality Alliance, they you know started doing the FREA audits. And that's where we discovered that about only at the time when we did the first one, about only about three percent of our funding was going to organizations that were led by minoritized women. And so that was an impetus to change that. Um and so I'm not quite sure that answers your question, Alice, but there's a whole range of different sources, reports and conversations, really, that have kind of influenced the thinking over that time. And obviously, the, you know, what the board brings, you know, from their, their role, as well as being small board members, they're kind of, you know, doing a lot of their other work as well, you know, that they've, they've got. I think the key thing is that you don't have to start from scratch. <laughs> there is actually, um, a, you know, as your other podcasts have probably, you know, uh, opined on, there are lots of resources out there, um, especially in the funding sector, where there are there are active people thinking about this stuff and thinking about ways forward and having done it as well. So there are, you know, there's people are on different parts of the journey. So on the shadowing, for example, we've got resources that we're not protective about. If you want to do something here, have that roles and responsibilities document that sets out, you know, what each party is able to get from this opportunity, what their obligations are in this in this partnership. Um, so there are lots of resources out there. On a governance, from a governance perspective, I wanted to give a shout out to Getting On Board, who do a lot of work around diversifying board governance and the value of doing that and how to do it. So really, lots of resources there about how you go about thinking about diversifying your board, the work that you need to do before you think about actually even taking a first step and then the practicalities of recruiting and retaining people. And um, there is Trustee Week coming up where they've got the Festival of Trusteeship between the 6th and the 10th of November this year, uh, which is an annual event. And again, they've got a session exploring sort of insights on lived experience on boards and lots of other things. So uh, a real sort of minefield of, of resources there's also people like the Action for Trustee Diversity by Malcolm John, who supports that work. So, you know, lots of lots of support there for people from minoritized groups who are thinking of aspiring to be trustees. Young Trustee Movement would be the other one for young younger people. So there are, again, um, and there's between those three organizations, there's a wealth of knowledge. So again, if anyone is thinking about because um, again, one of my reflections on this conversation is Paul's talking to us whenever the question arises, Paul's spoken about the board. And so it, it just recognises how important that structure becomes in either enabling an organisation to progress, or stopping them from progressing. Because actually, you know, if we were there arguing, no, we don't want to move in this direction, Paul, as the chief exec, would have to take account of that. So that sort of leadership level at that governance level, I think is really important. So if there, is, there are organisations that want to shift, then their board is instrumental to them making that shift. Uh, um, and so diversifying the, the thoughts, the, the thinking of those people into the room is really important. And all of those resources are fantastic. Yeah, I think for, for me, how I learned, I guess, on an individual basis is a lot from peers as well. And so I've tended to seek out groups or forums or whatever you want to call them. So there was a initiative that has finished now, but it's, the members of it have gone on, on to join other sort of similar networks. But there's an initiative called the Just Foundations Initiative, which was a small group of charity chief execs of trust and foundations, which came together to influence and encourage ourselves to do more on racial justice within our funding and that that was really important in terms of my own personal journey, and and also still connected to a lot of the individuals that were in that group. So you know, as a result of that, you could argue that some of the work we're doing in Middlesbrough is a direct result of of reaching out into a group like that. There's now the Foundations for Social Justice, isn't there? That's a, a big network of funders, and I think forums like that are always useful for organisations such as ourselves. But we've also been involved in an informal forum with about five or six other funders um, where we we were all um, concerned with what are the routes to influence for small grassroots organisations. And so we all came together to put a bit of funding into commissioning a report about that. And that, again, has certainly influenced some of Smallwood's um, direction of travel. I think it's also helped those foundations to look at their own funding through a bit more of a gender lens as well. So all of those things I think are really important. 
we couldn't have done any of this in isolation, you know, which can be a challenge sometimes. If you're really well endowed trust or foundation, there's sometimes, you know, it's, it, there's not a lot of impetus is there to reach out into the wider world. Yeah, I think, as you say, there's lots of lots of helpful resources and people and organisations out there to learn from. Uh, well, I think we're we're at about around an hour, so I think we'll go wrap up now. Is there anything else that you wanted to say if we missed anything out? Or do you want to promote anything or make a request of the audience at all? I guess, you know, as we've been talking, Alex, is if we're very open to hearing from others and sharing what we're doing, learning from from them, you know, we're very open to co-funding, you know, initiatives that meet our mission. Um, and certainly with the shadowing program as well, we're very keen to keep on, you know, expanding that and developing that. So we're, you know, get other trusts and foundations involved in that in some way. So, you know, we're very happy to have those types of conversations with others. Thank you both very much for your time been uh, really interesting uh we'll share some of those uh resources and things on the website uh, yeah, so, I can probably, okay. actually, alex i can probably email you some <laughs> rather than my jumbled answer so i can probably email you some of the things i talked about probably might be easier <laughs> thank you for listening to this episode of the charity impact podcast thank you for giving us your time and attention i know how precious a resource time is i hope you enjoyed the show If I could trouble you for a further two minutes of your day, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a review on your podcast player via ratethispodcast.com slash charity. You can engage with us on LinkedIn and Twitter, just search Charity Impact Podcast, or search Charity Impact Podcast in your browser to find our website where you can email me directly and you can subscribe to our email list for the opportunity to submit questions for me to ask upcoming guests. You can also find all the show notes and the previous episodes and links to resources that our guests have recommended there. Until next time, take care and thanks for listening.